Hello everyone. Continuing with the series today, we will take up the question and answers of Economic Class 9, Chapter 2, which is People as Resources. This is a bit lengthy exercise, so without wasting any more time, let's start our session with Megha Goyal. So our first question is, what do you understand by people as a resource? It refers to the fact that the human beings are assets for an economy and they are the working capital having different productive skills and abilities. People as a resource contribute to the creation of the national product. The population of a country becomes human capital when there is an investment made in form of education, training and medical care. Second question. How is human resource different from other resources like land and physical capital? Answer to this is human resource. I will first tell the points to human, for human resource and then for other resources. For human resource, the first point is it is an active factor of production. Human resource can make use of other and physical capital also. Second point, it is not just for production but also for consumption. Third point, tailors, engineers, doctors, teachers are example of human resource. Now coming to the second part that is the other resources or physical resources. The first point is these are the passive factors of production. These factors cannot be useful themselves and requires agents like human labor. Second point, these factors are for production only. Thirdly, examples of such factors are machines, tools, buildings, etc. Third question, what is the role of education in human capital formation? Answer to this is, talking generally about the role education plays in individual life is very vital. One country is determined by its people and further the status of the country depends upon the literacy level of the population. And now, if we know what is the role of education in human capital formation, it makes people capable of reading, writing, speaking and understanding. It improves the level of understanding of various important aspects of life. Next, it is helpful in opening new scopes for the people in different fields and provides encouragement. Next, it develops knowledge, skill and value of life. Next, it is helpful in enhancing the total productivity of labor and helpful in improving human behavior. Another point is, it promotes rational and scientific outlook for the solution of problems faced by the country. Coming to the fourth question. It is, what is the role of health in human capital formation? Health plays a significant role in same as education play. Good health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. If a person is not healthy, then he or she won't be able to work properly, whether the person is educated or not. Because the health of a person helps her or him to realize the potential and the ability to fight illness. Workers whose health is not good fall sick quite often and they cannot do their jobs efficiently. So, for the growth of the economy, a person's health is very important to be good. And moreover students, there is no one answer to such questions. This comprises the ability and sense of thinking and understanding the things in one's own way. You can add more points to this about what do you think and which is practical also. Moving ahead to question number 5. What parts does health play in the individual's working life? Okay, see, same here. Above it was for the bigger picture that is the capital formation and here you have to tell the importance of health in an individual's life. And this can vary from person to person. If we talk about in the general form, it plays a vital role in keeping our body in motion actively and making us do the work and other activities. Thus, making an effective and efficient citizen of the country and not the liability. Worker whose health is not good fall sick quite often and they cannot do their jobs efficiently. Moving ahead to next question, question number 6, it says, What are the various activities undertaken in the primary sector, secondary sector and the tertiary sector? Starting with the primary sector, the various activities under primary sector are agriculture, forestry, poultry, animal husbandry and mining. This sector basically deals with agriculture 
this sector deals with using the resources available in the natural form and converting them into some usable products for consumption. Se the secondary sector. The secondary sector involves construction of large buildings, typically a large structure and manufacturing which refers to the process of converting raw material components or parts into finished goods that meet a customer's expectations or specifications. It commonly employs a man-machine setup with division of labor in a large-scale production. Lastly, if talking about the tertiary sector, tertiary sector involves transport, communication, banking, health, education, insurance, and many other services sector lines. This sector is a predominantly governed by the educated section of the society. With this, moving ahead to our next question, question 7. What is the difference between economic activities and non-economic activities? So, first talking about the economic activities, these are the activities which are performed for money and result in economic income, which is called economic activity. These activities add value to the national income. Secondly, they generally carried out to satisfy human needs. And third, examples of such activities result in monetary gains like mining, forestry, etc. Now, talking about the non-economic activities, those activities which are not performed for money and do not result in economic income are called non-monetary activities. Secondly, they carried out for gaining social and physiological satisfaction. Examples of such activities include social service activities like volunteering in an NGO or charity or donation or etc. Moving to the next question, question number 8. Why are women employed in low paid work? Okay, this is a very hype question and we generally see discuss, uh, people discussing about this. So following are the reasons which are responsible for the low paid employment of women. Number 1. Higher education is required for more pay, but socially males are prioritized in education. But yes, now the time has changed and in some area it is still changing. Secondly, there are few places where men are put at top priority because of being a male dominated world. Women are kept inside the house due to which training and skill can't be gained by them, which is a requirement for responsible and well-paid employment opportunities. And thirdly, there are few works which need more physical strength, but women are consideredly physically weak and thus are paid less even for the same number of hours worked. Discussing our next question, question 9. How will you explain the term unemployment? So, we can say unemployment is that situation when a person wants to work at given wages but due to different causes they are unable to get work. The working population include people from 15 to 59 years, boys and girls below the age of 15 years and men and women above the age of 59 are not categorized under working population. So, discussing our 10th question, it says, what is the difference between disguised unemployment and seasonal unemployment? So, first let's discuss what is seasonal unemployment. Seasonal unemployment happens when people are not able to find jobs during some months of the year. That is related to seasonal, some months of the year. For example, agriculture in India is not a whole time occupation, it is seasonal. The cultivators generally grow only one crop in a year. As such, in the rural sector and in the lean season, the cultivators and the hired agriculture workers find no work to do. And the seasonal character of agriculture in India leads to seasonal unemployment. Discussing about what is disguised unemployment, it refers to that employment in which the number of workers are more which are indulged in a job where there is no requirement of those workers. And if some of them are withdrawn from the job, the production will not be affected. In disguised unemployment, people appear to be employed while actually they are not adding to productivity. This happens in agriculture where five peoples are required but more than that is occupied. 
Moving ahead to question number 11. Why is educated unemployed a peculiar problem of India? So, answer to this is, it has become a very common issue in urban areas even for the people having master's degree, higher qualification. This problem has become very peculiar in the following ways. Number one, there has been national investment on training and skill building of the professionals. And when they do not get jobs, then they can't contribute to the national development. Thus, the investment yields no returns. Secondly, surplus of employment is one of the major issues as the number of people who are under disguised employment is very high. Number three, the increase in the number of educated unemployed population means that the economic activities too are slowed down as these activities would have been providing employment if they were in a full pace. After understanding this situation, let's discuss our next question, question number 13. Can you suggest some measures in the educational system to mitigate the problem of the educated unemployed? Again, again student, this differs from individual to individual and based upon one's thinking and their idea of education system, we can provide many measures to reconsider the current education system. And some can be number one. Today, the education system is more based upon the rote learning concept, rather it should be more focused on the learning aspect of the things which are being taught these days. Secondly, more of practical learning should be engaged rather than the theory. Theory is also must but to the extent of its sufficiency. Number three, the student must be made aware and encouraged about self-employment and not being dependent on jobs only. And also, apart from these points, I would like to tell your views to me in the comment section below. Moving ahead to question number 14. Can you imagine some village that initially had no job opportunity but later came up with many? See students, we just talked about encouraging the activities and skills which are important for the growth of an individual. So for this question, I would like you to talk to the people around you. They can be your father, mother, grandparents, neighbors and anybody and get from them the interesting stories related to this. Students understand this point. This not only encourages to know new things but also helps you in conversating with people and get to know some valuable points which might not have been mentioned in the answer provided. So will you? I believe you will definitely. So with this note, let's move ahead to our last question, question number 15. Which capital would you consider the best? Land, labor, physical capital and human capital and give the reasons why. Among land, labor, physical capital and human capital, human capital will be considered the best capital because it is an active factor of production whereas all the other three are passive factors of production. It is the human capital which produces the goods and services by combining the other three factors of production because these three factors will be useless without the human capital. But at the same time, we cannot ignore these factors as all factors are complements of each other. Okay, with this, we have together completed the back exercise of this chapter. I know it was a bit lengthy, but I will be looking forward for the interesting stories or some values you got in the comment section below. Till then, please like the video and share the video. Thank you and bye-bye.